Welcome and thank you for standing by. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode until the question and answer session at the end of today's conference. If you would like to ask a question at that time, you may press star 1. Be sure to record your first and last name clearly when prompted. Today's conference is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. Now I'd like to turn the conference over to your host, Joyce Rose. Thank you. You may begin. Thank you, and welcome to the Child Welfare Information Technology Systems Managers and Staff webinar series brought to you on behalf of the Health and Human Services Administration for Children and Families, Children's Bureau, and presented by ICF International. I'm Joyce Rose, your host and moderator for today's webinar, and today's webinar is entitled From Waterfall to Agile, Understanding the Differences and Managing the Cultural Impact. Due to changes in funding availability and priority, the opportunities for in-person discussions and networking among professionals working on agency child welfare IT systems are limited. As an alternative, the Division of State Systems within the Children's Bureau continues to provide a series of webinars supporting information sharing and discussion. The content of the webinars is structured so as to appeal to state and tribal welfare staff participating in an agency's child welfare initiative. Next slide, Elizabeth, please. We will be doing monthly presentations from December through September 2015. Our target audience is state and tribal child welfare IT systems managers and staff, and state and tribal uh, program and policy staff. All uh, webinars are recorded and will be published to the, to the link uh, shown on this slide. Next slide, please. Today's webinar is entitled From Waterfall to Agile, Understanding the Differences and Managing the Cultural Impacts, which I think you will find unique and interesting as our guest presenters, Kevin Burt, Wade Owen, and Tom Kine, will share their state's agile journey. The next webinar topics are, in January, Bridging the Partner Gap, Best Practices in Working with the Courts. In February, Bridging the Partner Gap, Best Practices in Working with Education. And then we move to the Project Management Office, the Effects of Organizational Improvement Frameworks on Large System Development. In April, we will talk about the CMMI uh, model, Demystifying the Capability Maturity Model. Uh, integration, and then the last webinar that is planned right now is uh, going to be focused on managing today's electronic workforce. So, who uh, who is all attending today? <clears throat> Attendees are um, encouraged to participate in our webinar with questions and comments. All of the participant lines are muted now, but we will open them to the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. However, please be aware that you can submit questions at any time using the GoToWebinar chat feature, and those also will be addressed during the Q&A session. Should we run out of time, we will respond to your questions via email, and or should you have additional questions, you may submit those to me at the email address listed on the slide, joyce at kss.com. Now, who is attending today's webinar? Well, we are very interested in knowing who is attending, as it is our intent throughout all the webinars to make the content applicable and attractive for everyone participating in an agency's child welfare information effort. We ask that you self-select one of the five categories listed. Elizabeth, will you please conduct the poll? I have. I've gone ahead and opened up the poll, so if you could please choose from the appropriate uh, category. We do have a relatively large audience today, so we're really interested, um, as we always are, in knowing who is joining us. So I'll give you just a minute here to go ahead and cast your vote. Um, if you are participating in a room full of people, I would say uh, pick the category that represents the majority of people in the room. slowing down a little bit. We have 85% of you. We could just get the last couple people to go ahead and tell us who you are. Last 11%. If you could click on the right category, correct category for you. Go ahead and 
exit. And it looks like for today we have 34% uh, state child welfare information system project managers. 44% our largest group is state child welfare information system program policy or technical staff. We have 6% tribal representatives, 2% that are child welfare information system project managers, and 4% that are tribal child welfare program policy or technical staff. And special welcome to the 16% of our participants who are ACF Children's Bureau personnel or ACF contractors. That uh, is an excellent representation as uh, we all know that um, agile development processes touch across all disciplines within an agency. So let's move to our uh, webinar format. Uh, we'll be doing a brief introduction, uh, talk about some objectives. Uh, we'll, the participant presentations will last about 60 minutes. We'll do a Q&A session, and then we'll, um, we'll do a short wrap-up. So let's uh, introduce our participants. Uh, I am extremely pleased to welcome Kevin Burke who is the Assistant Director of the Eligibility Services Division at the Utah Department of Workforce Services. Mr. Wade Owen, who is the Technical Director for the Utah SACLA system named SAFE. And Tom Kine, who is the Application Development Supervisor for the Social Services Information System and also Manager of the Minnesota SACLAS. To our webinar objectives, <coughs> We're going to showcase three state initiatives, the Utah Safe Modernization Project, the Utah Affordable Care Act Compliance Project, and the Minnesota North Star Care for Children Project. And in each case, what cultural impacts occur by using the agile development processes. We will talk about the business case. We'll do some overview and some goals. Um, and we'll look at agile concepts. Uh, outcomes, lessons learned, key insights, and future plans for each of the three projects. So let's start with um, <clears throat> with why you are all here, and let's listen to our state presentations. We're going to start with Wade Owen. We'll talk about the Utah Safe Modernization Project. Wade? All right. Thank you, Joyce. <clears throat> um, let's go ahead and advance to the next slide. I thought I'd start with just a brief overview of uh, what our system's like and some of the conditions here in Utah. So. We have a, a big legacy system written in Power Builder and running against a SQL Server backend. And our future direction, well, actually, current and future direction is to move towards .NET architecture, web-based and mobile. And we decided uh, to use an agile methodology um, to switch to that for both our new development and to manage our maintenance and enhancements. We're doing that with a, a group of mixed contract and state staff and unlike maybe some of your projects, we have staff augmentation contracts, which have been pretty flexible and allow us to, uh, to work with Agile maybe a little better than, than maybe a fixed price contract. Um, we have a very limited modernization budget. We're trying to, like a lot of states, do a lot with a little. So next slide, please. We had several goals, and um, I kind of distilled these down. We wanted to be more responsive in terms of change delivery. Our, historically, uh, with Power Builder and just a regular waterfall kind of methodology, we had delivered three to four releases a year maximum. We also wanted to, uh, so we wanted to get to where we were doing that much more often, which we've accomplished at this point. Um, we wanted to simplify as we move forward into the to the web world and the mobile world is to simplify and provide a better user interface for the workers. Um, we definitely, while we're focusing on web-based uh, development at this point, we, we, we are looking forward to, towards mobility, so we're trying to design with that in mind. And then as we talk about strategic path, um, we wanted to get away from Power Builder um, because we did not feel it was a real sustainable way long term to, to move forward. So. We joined a fairly large camp at the state that's in the .NET world, and as we moved into Agile, we thought that that would be really more nimble and help us accomplish some of the goals and the responsiveness that we wanted to get to. Um, Agile's uh, seeing a lot of usage throughout the software development world, and you might not know this, but it also spills even into manufacturing processes and uh, you know physical design processes and not just software processes. So it's kind of a big movement getting bigger all the time. And if you don't know a whole lot about agile development, this isn't a, a training on agile per se. 
Um, there's lots of resources out there on the internet. Um, if you're just starting, I would refer uh, you to the Agile Manifesto. You can just search that on Google, and it would talk about some of the goals and the, and the emphasis of Agile. Um, the focus for Agile is on working software, so we're developing things that work versus lots of artifacts necessarily. Um, okay, next slide please. So I wanted to talk a little bit about sprints. You might be uh, familiar with that term. Um, the term itself kind of implies this quick movement in a, sh in a short duration, and that's exactly what it is. So instead of a long uh, several month process of getting a release out, we're defining ours as a four week um, cycle. And so it's de a defined repeatable uh, piece of work. Uh, you focus on what you can actually get out uh, to the users in that short period. Sometimes sprints are as short as two weeks depending on, on the group that's doing it, sometimes as long as a month, but probably not a lot more than that. And the sprint itself a lot of people, when they think of Agile, they're thinking of, oh, Julie, we don't have very much process. And my actual experience is that the sprint is actually very highly defined and very highly planned. Um, so, and what I mean by that is when we start into a sprint, we have a backlog that's sized and estimated at a task level, and we assign those resources to the team that works on them, and we manage that throughout the, uh, throughout the month. And it's, uh, so it's, it's highly managed. Um, we like the idea of a phased approach. And I, you know, another term for that is iterative. Um, it, it plays into how you design things. And for example, um, we have just done a case list window. And rather than a big massive case list window, our first iteration is a very minor little list. It was easy to build and create in a month. And we will add layers of functionality to that in coming sprints. So you get to deliver things frequently. Sometimes you don't always deliver that to the field, but it's a working piece of software that gets done in a month. And that's, it's really kind of a, a nice thing to see. So you, the users get to see and use the product sooner. And the small size of that unit makes everything more manageable, which I would when I say everything, I'm talking about analysis, coding, testing, integration, training. All those activities are now sized down to that small piece. And it, it, uh, it really works out pretty well. Um, next slide. So in sprint planning, it's considerably different than our classical waterfall planning. In classical waterfall planning, we've got this big Microsoft project file and a huge list of tasks and projects, and those are all worked out into detail, and it lays out this comprehensive plan for however long it is, up to a number of years. With Agile, um, your long, I'll even start at the bottom here, your long-term planning is actually quite fluid. You certainly know at a high level the kinds of things you want to accomplish. For example, with safe modernization, we know the modules that we need to create, and we know roughly an order that we might want to create those in. But that's very fluid depending on what happens in the in, in coming months. So we do some pretty specific planning in terms of three to six months. And then when you get down to the sprint level and you've sized and you've groomed your backlog, meaning that you've, you've uh, prioritized and gotten the things into the list of things that you need to do, um, when you get to that point, and you're ready to lay that into a sprint and apply resources to it, it's very detailed at that point. So for your month, you're, and I've mentioned that before, we're, we're very detailed in our planning and our execution. Um, but we don't always know the end product from the beginning, I guess would be one point that I'd make. As we talk about phasing, it might be we have a general idea, but that can change and evolve as we go through. So that's a little bit different uh, uh, mindset. Um, I would kind of point out, too, that when we made those big waterfall plans that spanned a number of years, that in many respects those were all fiction in a way. We kind of just created them without always having a lot of knowledge about each task and project. And, and then we were sometimes held to those plans that, that really weren't based on a lot of facts necessarily. So uh, next slide, please. Now, uh, just an overview on roles 
it's a little different with Agile than maybe some of our traditional roles. And I've got some points here to talk specifically about a product owner, but if you look at a sprint team, you typically have what they call a scrum master, and I'll get to the scrum concept in a minute. That's roughly analogous to a project lead who's managing um, you know, the tasks and the completion and making sure that everything happens in that, in that sprint, in that month, it needs to happen. Um, you have a product owner, and I'll get some detail there, and then you have um, team members. And the point that I want to make here is that when you get in a team on a sprint, you may or may not define yourself by maybe some of the traditional skills that you have always defined yourself by. So you might be a DBA by trade, and on this team, and you may have to do some other tasks, some test plans, or you know, some other kind of thing. So it's uh, you're seen as a resource, and your skills can help work on that end product. But there's some self-organization that takes place based on those skills. But uh, you, you may you may find yourself doing some different things than you have in the past. The point I wanted to talk about with product owner is that this is really a, a, a business resource that comes into the team. And it's a really key thing that we found out um, the hard way. Uh, if you don't have that product owner in your team and defined and available, that it can actually um, cause you some real problems in delivering your software. So um, the product owner has an overall responsibility for a project success. They've got to be empowered. And the point that I want to make there is that sometimes in our uh, historical way of doing things, and you may have diff different experiences in your states, but what we would see was that we'd have a business analyst, and they'd be over a project, and they would consult with program specialists and workers and various stakeholders, and there would be this month and month cycle that just goes on and on of either email chains or trying to wait till next month's meeting to talk about some more requirements before you can build that business spec and move forward. Um, that's a real problem for Agile. You really need to bring that in and compress it. So the product owner brings a lot of that into the team. Certainly, you still have to consult with stakeholders. Um, but they bring that into the team and are empowered to make decisions during that month. And that's what helps get you through those design processes and uh, get to where you can code and then pr produce that output. So they convey vision. They outline work. Um, there's a prioritization process that takes place, and they may very well work with another group that helps with prioritization. But when they, when the product owner comes into the team, they know what those priorities are and can make decisions during the month based on those priorities. Um, and then availability is a big issue too. So a product owner isn't somebody that's available 30 minutes a week uh, to answer questions. It's a person that's really engaged to the team and is available at any time to answer questions and give the direction that's needed. Uh, next slide, please. So, and I'll probably say this again later, but uh, Agile, what I found, is a, a journey, not a destination necessarily. So I would say that we are part way down that road here on SAFE. Um, we have a long ways to go, and we're trying to make some of those changes as we move forward. But even with the limited amount, well, limited is not the right word. We've done a significant amount. But uh, I'll get into some of the things that we still need to do in, in some next slides. But even with what we've done, um, we have this idea of a, uh, a daily scrum meeting. Now, that might be a new term for a lot of you. Um, scrum is a, is a rugby term. And if you've ever watched rugby, they have this, it's like a huddle, sort of like in uh, football. But it's this big chaotic um, meeting that this group gets together and kind of talks about what they're going to do in the game. That's what happens really on this Agile team. You get together every day. It's a short meeting. You stand, uh, typically stand up to keep the meeting short. And it creates a lot of transparency because every day, every person on that Scrum team talks about what they're doing. And they talk about maybe the problems that they might be having. And then you identify resources. You do it very quickly. You don't solve the problems in the meeting. But it's used to daily keep things in focus. And uh, we have found that, even with our imperfections in Agile, to be absolutely um, enabling for us. And it's, 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 it, 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 I talk about, I've got an, a bullet here for our Power Builder backlog. We had a, a large number of calls 
that had kind of languished for a while. And as we got into this scrum mode and the monthly release mode, we knocked through those very, very quickly, just with those two changes. Um, we also saw improvements in, in our testing uh, because that communication was taking place every day. They could say, oh, well, make sure you test this, or um, have you thought about this? So um, even though we have a long way to go, there's uh, not a, there's not a feeling that we would want to move back because we've seen so many benefits so far. Okay, next slide, please. Um, in this slide, I want to talk about some of the things that we still need to do. Um, we have a great group of people who is very good at coordinating and communicating in a lot of ways and cooperating, but with agile you're really talking about a team mentality, and that's a culture shift that we're still working on. Um, and what I mean by that is we can end up having a room with 20 people working on 20 individual projects and not, as, not feeling responsibility to each other to complete the work for the sprint. They kind of look at their own work and just get it done. So what we want is a team with common goals and responsibilities, and when somebody fails, it's the whole team failing. So we're implementing some things to try to improve that in the coming months. Um, it's important to have individual commitment to Agile, and I think we've got some places on our team that maybe we don't have true believers in everybody yet. We're trying to, uh, to counter some of that with some training that's available that we're sending people to. And what we're, the approach we're doing is we have some people on the team, and I think it's common to a lot of teams, is you have a person who's a de facto leader. He may not be in the org chart as a leader, but he's that specialist that people look to and admire and listen to. And so we're sending some of those people to our um, Agile training to try to help improve our commitment to Agile as a, as a, as a group. One of the things that we've struggled with, and I've kind of alluded to this, is that... Uh, getting the timely business involvement. And, and initially, because we couldn't get the quick turnaround that we wanted with the product owner like I just talked about, we kind of actually would separate that analysis portion so that it wasn't really part of our sprint. And so we would wait till that analysis was done and then start a coding sprint, which is a legitimate way to do it. Um, but the problem was is the analysis um, was taking so long and our team was doing so well in terms of delivery that we ended up with a real bottleneck in terms of providing uh, work for them to code to. So that's why we're trying to pull that into a closer model where we're, we're doing some real-time analysis and getting some specs to them much more quickly so that we can code and deliver more quickly. Um, and another problem that we've had, and I think this happens a lot, especially on states with limited budgets and big operational support issues, is that we tried to mix our operational support and our development work onto the same teams. And the problem with that is that the operational tends to trump the development work. Every crisis comes in and suddenly you, you, you're not delivering as much development as you'd like. So we're working to find ways, creative ways, to split that out and make sure that those development teams can be heads down and you've got resources that you can plan and, you, and, and know that you're going to be able to utilize during your sprint. Um, another reality, I think, for a lot of groups, and I think this is probably true even out in industry but not, and not just government, but uh, we have a group of existing people and we'd love to have the top end, everybody uh, uh, in terms of skill, and capabilities, and, and, but there's a reality in terms of having to bring people up or maybe just some core capabilities that people don't have. And so we're having to be creative using the people we have to try to still um, move forward. Um, next slide, please. So these are just some of our lessons learned, and I've mentioned this for, uh, before. And the reason I mention it more than once is because I think a lot of people, when they think of Agile, they're thinking, oh, this is a technical process. This is, what the, this is what the development group is going to do to get the, the work done. And in reality, Agile really can't work without committed business resources. So from the top down, from the executive stakeholders down to the subject matter experts, they need to be committed into Agile and integrated into the process. It's not just a technical process. And our historical practice, as I said, insulated people from 
uh, some of our program people from the development teams. That, it was kind of an us and them thing. So we are trying to engage and uh, get them involved. Um, we have a business culture, and this is probably fairly common as well, um, where they 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 want to get they they'll identify at a business level, not even at the technical coding level, but at the, as a child and family services level. There's a list of a hundred projects that they want to work on, and they assign a whole bunch of things out and just make incremental progress on a hundred projects. And it really works best if the business culture can say, no, these are our top three things, and we're going to really focus our resources on them for the next short term so that we can knock these three things out and then move on to other things. In reality, um, while it feels like you're getting stuff done working on 50 or 100 projects, um, you really, in, in total, get more done working on a few specific things and focusing your, your energies. Um, and then that last uh, bit is that we the, the resource issue, and I mentioned that in the last slide. So go ahead and please uh, progress to the next slide. Um, this is another little insight. Um, I think in a lot of organizations, the physical location of offices and cubicles tends to revolve around political and power hierarchies rather than what really makes sense to be the most efficient. That can be hard to overcome. Um, but I think it's really important um, to co-locate your teams. That means mixing um, your business and technical staff. Some places even have, you know, the technical staff are in a different wing of the building from the, from the, or maybe in another building from the business staff. So it's good to co-locate, and even at a more granular level that your web team, uh, and they're small teams, that you locate each of those together. Even in a bullpen kind of a situation is a great idea if you can do that, so that they're there and interacting um, uh, every day. The other thing that's a good thing to do is to split your operations and your development teams and physically separate them so that the operations, um, you don't get over the wall interruptions that impact the development team. Because that can certainly happen, especially because you've got a lot of your specialists that are on the development teams. Next slide, please. And I've talked a little bit about this too, the design process. So what we're trying to do is make our design processes more close to real time. So rather than this big serial process of emails and correspondence and monthly meetings, that we're getting the right people into the right room and typing it up as we go and coming out with something that's useful. Um, one of the principles in Agile is that artifacts, meaning design documents or test plans or uh, any one of a number of art, uh, artifacts, are tools. They're not end products. They're not our deliverables. They are something that's used to help deliver software. So um, we want to be flexible in the tools we use and how we use them. You certainly need documentation. It doesn't mean that Agile is something you just sit down and start coding because you're Agile. Um, no, you really still need some tools, but you, you have some flexibility as a team to decide what's going to help you get to that um, endpoint. It might be that a note on a napkin is a low-end document that can help you move forward, and that's just fine. Or it might be that you need a really detailed test plan. Those can just depend on what kind of work you're doing. Um, you have to have teamwork. I've talked about that a little bit. Um, there's a concept of good enough rather than perfect as well. So you might just have to make some compromises in order to make this small iteration with a usable piece of code it might just have to be good enough for that iteration rather than perfect, because that perfect tends to push you out beyond your time frames. Um, as we design things, it's uh, one of the things that we've had in the past as well is that um, you try to approach a design and come to a consensus agreement with a large group of people that um, something's right or a, a, a rule is correct. And that kind of approach just is too slow. So. You work in a group, and if you can't get consensus, you, you have decision makers that can make that call. Uh, next slide, please. So, um, and this is a business side thing as well. Um, I've talked about prioritized projects. One of the things that the executive leadership can do is give you that um, prioritized list 
if they're not doing that already. And again, focusing on a small number of projects. And uh, engagement, just engagement in your overall work is important. And sometimes it's easy for your uh, upper executives to be focused towards the legislature or to, uh, um, outside projects or regions, but it's really important that they also focus inward on the development projects in your shop. Now, I also included on this slide a, a little discussion about contract management. And one of the things that I found, and I mentioned this at the start, is that it's hard to get a contract model that fits Agile exactly. This fixed price is, by its nature, more closely tied to waterfall because you're really defining all the things that you need for a system, and then they're going out and bidding that overall um, system versus, um, gee, we don't know exactly what we need. We know what uh, we want to do in the next three to six months, and we kind of have an idea. So. I guess what I'm looking for and asking for is how to, I mean, we have this time and materials model that we're using, staff augmentation contracts, but I wonder if there's a better model that could be created around Agile. Um, next slide, please. And this is another challenge as you move to Agile, and that is that the oversight groups, whether it's your federal partners or your legislature or uh, even senior management, they're used to seeing waterfall type plans. They're used to long-term uh, projections, and uh, you know that's part of your funding request. And so you can find yourself actually having to create a static list of projects, kind of like you did before, for these purposes that you're not really managing to in the agile world. And so finding a middle ground between those ex historical kinds of expectations helping them understand what you can and can't do, and, and finding a, a legitimate way to ask for funding. Um, and, it, and it's legitimate to ask for them to want to know what you're going to be doing with the money that they're uh, giving you. But finding a middle ground where you could all be um, working together and, and, and getting what you need would really be helpful. And so next slide, please. This is just a slide to talk a little bit about our future plans. We've been involved clear through December, late November and through December in refining our process. Um, and we're going to roll that out with our team in January, February, and maybe beyond. We decided to be agile in those um, process improvements, partly because uh, we don't have them all defined yet perfectly. And we want to engage our team in, in helping us to even refine those further. Um, but partly just because the cultural change is so big, we don't want to in a, in a, inject too much change all at once. So um, I mentioned that we're bringing our training in, and we're not just training technical people, but we're training our program people and our business people with that as well. And that actually took some creative financing because those training funds are actually, this time, are coming out of our technical budget. And so we had some support from our technical side that they recognized that it was important to get everybody involved. And so we're bringing a, uh, a trainer in-house, which keeps the cost fairly reasonable. And I would assume most states have local resources to get some training. That's not something you necessarily have to, to send out of state for. Um, we're planning on embedding our program people as our um, entire teams, as the product owners, and to really help us shorten those development cycles. We're splitting our operation and development teams, as I mentioned. And uh, one of the things we're looking at, and it's, this is one of the hard things to define, is we're, we've kind of had a backwards support model that involves our database administrators in frontline support more than we would like. And we're looking at a, a tiered support model that would um, shift some of that uh, to more like technician people who um, would handle the, the first tier and the triage of problems. Um, I talked about empowering the product owner. And I talked about our design. So we're really hoping that some of these things will help us. And we're excited to move forward with Agile. Uh, again, it's a journey and not a destination. Um, we're hoping to get more teamwork and more buy-in from individuals and then build our skills and uh, increase our what the Agile terms is velocity, which is your, the amount of work that you get done in a, in a given period of time. So that's my presentation, and thank you. Wait, thank you very much. And I am sure when we get to the Q&A session that there will be several questions for you. So let's move now to uh, Mr. Kevin Burke, 
who's going to talk to us and tell us about the Mandatory Affordable Care Act uh, Compliance Project. Kevin? Uh, good afternoon. If you want to go ahead and go to the next slide. I just wanted to do a quick uh, project overview. Uh, I work for the Department of Workforce Services. Uh, we determine eligibility for Medicaid, CHIP, SNAP, Child Care, and TANF. Uh, currently, we do have an integrated rules engine as well as an integrated business model, meaning that we're a state-based model, uh, not a region or county-based model. And uh, the project I'm going to talk about is the mandatory pieces of the Affordable Care Act, uh, which had a significant impact in the way the rules worked for Medicaid and CHIP. It went to what's called a MAGI methodology. Uh, and so as a state, we decided uh, the rule changes were so significant that at that time we would actually rewrite the rules for all the programs determined uh, by the Department of Workforce Services. So we submitted an advanced planning document, which is to request uh, some additional federal funding in February 2013. You can see the date was, was fairly late uh, because we had to be compliant by October 2013. And a lot of that had to do with the uh, political climate uh, related to the Affordable Care Act, so it took us a while to be able to get approval to request that uh, funding. And the A87 exception is, is just to be able to uh, also include the human services uh, programs uh, in the rules rewrite and get that funding as well. You can go to the next slide. Uh, so the business rules engine was built in-house, meaning we didn't contract it out. We did use the MAGI methodology. And we rewrote all program rules. And just as a reminder, it wasn't a screen rewrite. It was simply a rules rewrite. Uh, so what we were able to accomplish in that six months was a rewriting of the rules, whereas to the user, the screens looked the same. Uh, but when uh, they went to apply the evidence to get a, generate a decision, the rules uh, were uh, completely different. Uh, incorporating uh, some of the programs didn't change at all, of course, with the Affordable Care Act, but incorporating the mandatory changes with the Affordable Care Act. And so I wanted to go into some of the key success as we delivered this. If you could go to the next slide. The first one was, uh, and, and Wade mentioned this, is a decision maker has to be assigned full-time to the project. And uh, for a project this big, to me it, made, it had to be an executive level type uh, decision maker. Uh, and so what we have, just, just to understand the makeup here, the Department of Workforce Services, as I mentioned, uh, determines eligibility for all the programs in as a state agency for all programs except for Medicaid and CHIP. Department of Health uh, in Utah is, does not determine eligibility for the program but continues to house the policy and is a single state agency. And we contract DWS with the Department of Technology Services, which is our IT department. So that's the reason why... Um, the coordination with Agile really worked is you have three main players or main departments that need to coordinate together so well to be able to deliver something so large so quick. And so to me the key point was that we didn't want a decision token maker, uh, a, a token decision maker. It needed to be someone that could actually make a final uh, executive type decision for this type of process. Um, and it says watch out for snipers. Uh, that's, a, that's an agile term. A sniper is just someone um, who's not involved in the agile process. So from a distance, uh, they're shooting down project ideas and, and the progress and the pro uh, all the different things that are going on in agile. Oftentimes, you have a lot of people that want to be involved but aren't committed to being involved. And so that's where the snipers come in. And you just got to be careful of that because they're so used to a different design when you're first doing the Agile process. And in this case, actually, the late start helped minimize snipers because everyone knew that there was real tight timelines and we had to deliver it real quickly to meet the Affordable Care Act mandatory timelines. So that actually caused, in, in a lot of ways, the group to band together uh, because we knew the, uh, the ask was so great. And so I think that, that uh, sometimes we hesitate to jump into things late because we're afraid we're not going to be able to deliver it. Uh, but sometimes uh, short time frames or time boxes uh, really help uh, expedite because the decisions are made faster because they have to be. To go to the next slide, uh, and this is uh, what Wade talked about, is we believe, really believe the teams needed to be empowered to be able to make the decision, and they should not be going outside of the team for answers. If the team seemed to be going outside for answers, we didn't look at a way to create this rapid uh, answer uh, model 
we actually just reorganized the team because we felt the team wasn't sufficient to be able to get be empowered and be able to make the decisions. You can see the structure of the team was we had a scrum master, which was primarily IT, and we had a product owner, which was mostly represented by business or policy. We had the developers, the business analysts. We had a tester that was the end user. Uh, we brought in actual operational staff to be able to do the component testing. Uh, and then we had policy specialists that were uh, involved and program specialists or the trainers. Um, and the keys, uh, and this is the scrum, uh, the team met every morning in a stand-up or scrum to define what tasks were completed yesterday, what needs to be done today, and, uh, and they, they drove each process. Um, and in this case, we had to change uh, some of our state statutes, some of our rules, we had to rewrite policy. We had to develop new training because it was so different. We had to change notices. And in our um, scrums or in our sprints, not only was the IT being built, but all the pieces that needed to be completed were being built, meaning there were tasks to write policy. There were tasks to develop training, tasks to do notices. Uh, and so every piece from start to finish was built, and we didn't move on from developing that program until that was actually completed. To go to the next slide, uh, and so we had constant organized communication. Uh, we had a daily stand-up with the business owner, the policy owner, the project manager, and the, scr and, and the scrum master. So each department head that was there, dedicated full-time, co-located, met with the scrum master every morning. On top, and then the scrum master would go and have the uh, scrum team stand up that same day. We did also uh, have weekly conference calls with executive leadership. Uh, because there's a lot of people that can't dedicate the time to be there but need the status, risks, and concerns. And the key here is decisions made. We didn't use the weekly conference call to discuss what decisions needed were needed, but more just define what decisions were made so that executive leadership knew what was happening. Uh, so, it was, again, it was much more of a communication of what's done, not a permission-asking uh, conference call. And then we'd also do bi-monthly all hands where we'd pull in everybody in the project, kind of discuss how things are going, uh, and just address anything that was slowing the whole uh, group down, and also deliver some key messages and what's going to happen next. Communication was always in person, and it was uh, very less formal write-ups. And this is probably, of everything, the most difficult thing of Agile. Uh, waterfall, you have everything clearly defined, clearly written. And that's a really hard transition for a lot of people to have it agile um, and not have as many things in clear writing uh, and being developed as it goes and being written as it goes. And again, that's the reason why it's important to have the key decision makers involved. Uh, and if you could go on to the next one, and then the next one, uh, just to kind of to go over the project design, what we had is we had six scrum teams. One of the teams was a common rules team meaning they developed the individual program rules that were used across all programs. Uh, we didn't want each team uh, for each program writing how residency worked or writing how a relationship works or social security or citizenship. So we had one team that did all of the common rules. And if you could go to the next one. Uh, we had uh, three program teams. And uh, these, this is just a list of some of the programs that, uh, is, uh, that are determined in our eligibility rules engine. And what this did is, so the, ch the uh, child Medicaid ages 0 to 5 had very specific rules on top of the common rules. So the common rules were built, and these teams would deliver the program-specific rules. And you can see there are two additional teams there. And if you could go to the next slide. There was also an ancillary team, and what we found was that there was a lot of people that uh, as they were writing the rules or, or making the changes in the other scrum teams, they found that uh, you know, there were new notices that need to be created. There were maybe some screen changes that were needed. Uh, there was electronic uh, verifications in coordinating with the federal data hub, uh, that is healthcare.gov. And so what we did is we, we didn't want to slow down the teams in development of the program rules, and so we kicked a lot of miscellaneous stuff like that to the ancillary team as tasks and they would complete all of those. If a notice needed to be changed, the scrum team that, wrote, that was the program team would write the exact language that needed to be on the notice, and then the ancillary team would only follow and create that notice using that exact same language. And then, of course, we had an infrastructure team with test environments and builds. And my last slide, if you, if you go to that, is just some of the lessons learned in, in Agile. 
Uh, and IT, and this is the benefit of having everybody together to be able to challenge each other. Um, what I found is IT does not resolve flawed pr uh, procedures or operational designs. Uh, oftentimes, IT is just asked to work around bad business designs. And so what this did is by having a business owner there, you were able to challenge the process and redefine the process where it made more sense based on the changes that were being implemented, in this case, with the Affordable Care Act. Uh, number two is IT can be built to account for silo-produced policy, uh, but it's error-prone, it's expensive, it's confusing. And so uh, having everybody in the room, you can challenge the policy. Uh, waterfall, you don't get a chance to challenge that because it's already written, predefined, and you just have to build a, uh, around existing business requirements. And then finally, the, the third, the third uh, leg in the stool is IT shouldn't drive the process. Uh, oftentimes IT will push for the easiest way rather than the right way, uh, and so we challenge the IT as well. And just uh, real quick, the dedication of important resources, especially for a large project, you have to have a real decision maker to be able to make this thing go at the speed that we, that we had to go in this case. And again, short deadlines can really help expedite it. And again, it wasn't just an IT design. Scrum is not just an IT product. It's actually delivering the entire product. By the time the project was done, the policy was drafted, the procedures were drafted, the training was developed, you had experts because you had business there and frontline users that were able to uh, transfer that knowledge as you actually have to implement that you that you find. And uh, that's it for me. Um, Kevin, thank you so very much. I find uh, I found your lessons learned to be quite fascinating. And I suspect that Wade is uh, very grateful of having someone with um, prior Agile experience so that I, I'm sure he uh, probably leans on you a little bit for um, advice given that they are just starting uh, the Agile uh, in their SACWA system. So thank you again. And now let's move to uh, Tom Kine from Minnesota to tell us about the North Star Care for Children project. Tom? So in a, in a lot of ways, uh, I could just uh, say everything Wade and Kevin said and be done, right? Because they've really done a nice job of describing uh, Agile well and, and its use. So I, I think for for me, um, I'll, I'll take a little bit different approach to this. Could I have the next slide, please? So Minnesota, on the SACWIS project, started working to implement Agile uh, in 2011, and we did take a technical uh, approach to this rather than um, have the business heavily involved. So our focus was on minor enhancements and bug fixes and, and really on developers and QA. So there wasn't any business involvement and limited analysis involvement. And, and really that was a result of the fact that um, as development manager I didn't have much control over new development processes uh, but recognized that Agile could bring benefit to the project, uh, even in a limited way, in a limited use way. Um, up until we implemented Agile, we didn't have a defined release schedule here in Minnesota for the SACWIS uh, system, and there was a lot of skepticism about our ability to set and hit a release schedule. So in Minnesota, we um, historically really, uh, had two to three releases every couple of years. Um, and we set out uh, to develop a quarterly release schedule. Uh, and there are some reasons that that is a pretty agile schedule for Minnesota because we are uh, county administered. So, and I, there's some architectural reasons that, that that is plenty often enough. When we introduced agile, we spent about a year uh, really socializing the concept with the technical project team. And I mean talking about it and selling it and talking about the changes that it would in, in, engender, you know, across the technical staff. Um, in Minnesota, uh, it sounds similar to what Wade was describing in, in uh, Utah in that uh, we, our developers are state, state staff. There's no significant use of contractors. Um, and, and so there was a pretty fair amount of uh, training and preparation work required to get started with Agile. If I could have the next slide. So I'm going to show you three slides that are really busy um, graphically. 
Um, but these are these were the basis of conversations among uh, state staff here, again from the IT side. So these from from IT, I'm including the development team, analysis and design, quality assurance, help desk and infrastructure, not business. And the, the first slide that uh, we'll go to will show the roles and responsibilities within an agile release cycle. Um, the second slide, will, I'll talk about how new development fit into that, uh, which is similar, actually, to what Wade was describing, how they started. And the third slide, I want to talk about the supporting infrastructure. So if we could go to the next slide. Um, we use this to uh, in front of the entire division to talk about what Agile was. So we talked about uh, a quarterly release cycle, a couple of weeks, and if you look at the bottom, towards the bottom of the slide, a couple of weeks to start planning a sprint, um, three sprints within the release cycle, a couple of, couple of weeks to develop a pilot candidate, six weeks to pilot, and then we're out the door and on to the next sprint. And we also, through this then, discussed what the roles and responsibilities of the various players would be. So managers, functional analysts, systems analysts, developers, QA, and so on, down through this, what the expectations would be uh, for those areas. And we talked about this with the division as a whole, and then went to individual unit meetings for more questions and answers about how this would work. And um, Again, this was all about education and setting the expectations for staff. And, you know, it is a cultural shift if you've been working waterfall to move to Agile. And it, it takes time to get people prepared to make the changes. Could I have the next slide? And then this is an illustration of what Wade was describing with, with new development. Basically, um, at the top you have a one of our quarterly release cycles. At the bottom, you have an overlapping uh, quarter, uh, quarter, quarterly release. Um, and in the middle, uh, we have new development following a waterfall kind of approach. And the, you know, the problem with new development always is it's unpredictable as far as a, when anything will be ready, particularly in a, in a waterfall type process. So what we uh, said was that we'll focus our agile efforts initially on bug fixes and minor enhancements. We'll take that as the product backlog. It was simpler, and it was uh, a good base to develop agile processes and procedures within IT and relatively low risk. But we'd continue to run new development in a waterfall uh, manner, merging in new development only during the first sprint of one of these release cycles. And what that did was uh, give us time for full regression testing once we merged the code in. And it, uh, new development didn't put our schedule at risk. And the emphasis initially was simply on hitting the schedule and building credibility uh, both within the IT arena and with the business users, users that we could, in fact, establish a schedule and stick to it. And so hitting the dates was key to really changing attitudes and getting building credibility, getting buy-in to an agile process. Could I have the next slide? What I'm after with this slide was um, shorter release cycles put a lot of pressure on the IT infrastructure, and I, I don't know to what extent um, non-technical people realize that. But uh, for instance, with a quarterly release cycle, we're supporting three releases at any given time. We've got the current statewide release. Uh, that's in the field. We often, you know, we generally have a, a pilot in process somewhere, and often enough we have the pilot plus one release. And really, we need a place to run all of the, all three of those releases in order to handle issues, troubleshoot problems in the current release, work with the pilot, and be moving forward. And so our infrastructure team had to be prepared for this uh, as well and, and provide us with the need, needed uh, development and testing servers and environments in order to support this. And then new development also required a test bed so that it didn't interfere with um, whatever releases we were working on. Beyond that, all of this takes a pretty sophisticated source control and branching strategy. Um, it automated builds and deployments 
are needed because to to you know for the technical team to build all this for testing every night is, and deploy it into these internal servers would be a huge task if it weren't automated. And automated regression testing is a huge benefit; offers huge benefit in here as well. And so we in Minnesota employ all of those tools in order to help facilitate the agile process, but it takes time for the IT staff to develop the sophistication to be able to manage all that. Could I have the next slide? And then we really did start hitting our dates, and that's all this is about. Since 2012, we really haven't had any significant delay in a quarterly release. And in a, you know, in, the, in a way of talking about cultural shift, what that is done and what Agile has done here is it's shifted the conversation about what should be included in a release from the end of the cycle to the front. So it used to be at the end of the release we would engage in a lot of um, heated conversations about what additional functionality should be put into the release because as the release becomes later there's more pressure to put more and more fixes in it because the users and the business analysts know the next release is unpredictable or its data is. And that, putting more fixes in or making the release bigger, also makes it later. And it's a, it's, a, um, it's a bad cycle to be in. So once we started hitting these release dates consistently, there was a lot more willingness to defer work, to keep things to a manageable size, uh, knowing that we are hitting our dates and we're only three months away from the next release. So could I have the next slide? Um, and so the quarterly releases really were more successful than anyone expected. And as Wade said, I would second what he said, which is in addition to hitting these dates, our backlog of problem reports really started coming down. We started getting results with this uh, within a few releases. I um, mean, we actually got to the point where um, we were making significant inroads on reducing our backlog, backlog of uh, problem reports and, and small enhancements. Um, but from this phase of our Agile, I would say lessons learned were it, it is a long process to introduce Agile, or it can be to the technical team, um, particularly uh, in light of the technical sophistication needed to, to make this successful, at least in our case. Everyone needed time to adjust. But in the end, now that we are on this quarterly cycle and we work in in these defined sprints within that, the project does run a lot more smoothly. Um, everyone knows to, what to expect, and there, there's a rhythm to it. And so that was Minnesota's initial foray into Agile, and then we got this project called North Star. So if I could have the next slide. So this was a, this is a significant change in how Minnesota handles benefits for children in uh, uh, foster care, children in relative custody uh, assistance, and, and children from foster care have been adopted. So what it does is it sets a uniform subsidy for children in all those placement settings uh, in order to improve the um, uh, permanency of children. And it, it impacts all our children. But what also makes this complex is um, the current programs and the current methods of paying subsidies for children are also being maintained. So we need to develop these shifts in how we pay for funding and how we evaluate the, the funding levels or the subsidy levels for children in these different kinds of placement settings while maintaining everything that's already out there. Um, and I think both the business and IT were somewhat surprised when this legislation was passed. It had been proposed you know, a number of times to the legislature and, and had been turned down. And there wasn't much public discussion about this. So the legislation passed, and uh, we were left uh, with how to implement all of this. Could I have the next slide? And so there are a lot of moving parts. Guardian. Uh, SHIP assistance replaces relative custody assistance. There's a single uniform assessment process for all these different placement settings. 
um, called MAPSI, which is the Minnesota Assessment for Parenting Children and Youth. There's a uniform benefit set. And it's a fiscal partnership of state, counties, and tribes. And what that means is um, it's supposed to be cost neutral for the counties. And again, we're a county-administered state, so the, the counties um, are responsible for um, funding quite a bit of child welfare in Minnesota. And prior to this, foster care and relative custody assistance was paid by the counties, while adoptive subsidies were paid by the, uh, the central office. And subsequent to North Star, foster care will continue to be paid from the counties, but North Star kinship assistance and North Star adoption assistance will be paid for centrally. So we're changing how the payments work. And again, while maintaining everything that's legacy. So could I have the next slide? This um, had a had and has an aggressive timeline, so the legislation was passed in 2013 with the changes to take effect in December of 14. Um, and as you can imagine, <coughs> excuse me, not everything was well defined from the business side. Um, it's a complicated piece of legislation. It's it's hard for the it's hard even for the policy people to understand everything uh, that's in here. Um, so there's been a lot of um, interpretation and definition needed. And it's not well understood, or it wasn't well understood from the system side either. So, um, it, you know, basically we, we have uh, a, a big piece or a, a, a significant piece of change for the SACWIS system, not well understood by the business or IT, and it, as you can imagine, it was just a recipe for trouble, which is what we quickly got into. Could I have the next slide? And so as I've said, Agile had limited use in new development to this point. Um, this MAPSI, this Minnesota Assessment for Parenting Children and Youth, was on a particularly aggressive um, timeline. So the SSIS project was engaged in July of 2013, and they wanted MAPSI implemented in January of 14 in order to start piloting it, and we're actually talking about the potential of bringing on a contractor to do it. And we peeled that off and used an Agile-like approach in developing the MAPSI, the Minnesota Assessment for Parenting Children and Youth, and it was very successful. So it's a complex um, assessment of the uh, needs of the child and what the caregiver can provide in order to meet those needs. Um, with, with a complex set of calculations behind it uh, to develop a subsidy amount, but we did deliver it on time um, and have added additional features over several releases. So we got a base product out there, which is what Agile typically does, and, and then started enhancing it. But with the remainder of the project, we were in real trouble by about April of 14 trying to follow a waterfall process. There was just too much undefined. Um, and really, the development processes were unclear to the business, so they, they didn't have a full appreciation of our need for timely decisions. Um, and, and we had to have timely decisions due to the, the length and complexity of the, of the uh, you know, the analysis, the design, and the development tasks. Um, and so as, as both Kevin and, and Wade emphasized, one of the benefits of Agile is to get the business to a point where they can make timely decisions, and they do make timely decisions. And another another piece of this that was causing trouble was we were working basically through large committees sequentially. And so we were everyone was more or less working on everything. So in April, um, we I stop the project because we simply weren't going to make um, we weren't going to make any of our deadlines with where we were at and we engaged with an outside project manager so we, he was still within the state within IT but he hadn't been engaged on this project but um, we, we kind of got a, a stranger to come in take us off site as a group business and IT and we rescoped the project we developed a, a high level work down break a high-level work breakdown structure and develop a new schedule. And, and, you know, this is consistent with what Wade said is, you know, you can plan some of the larger parts um, without going into all the detail. And further complicating all this, 
for good measure is by this time, uh, IT within the state had been centralized into its own agency and separated from the business. So there were a lot of challenges around the fact that IT is reporting into a different organization, which is new for Minnesota. And I, I won't go into all the impacts of that, except to say it was another complicating factor in all this. Could I have the next slide? And all I'm sh showing on the next couple of slides is um, emphasizing the scope of this. We took the North Star project and um, broke it into a large number of sub-projects. And even after having done this at the work breakdown structure level, we still struggled with resource contention. We were still having trouble delivering anything because for the most part, we were still in large committees. We were still single-threaded. So finally what we did is we, we, we took a very agile approach to this. And, and the, I would say agile approach and agile-like because to a purist, I, I don't know what this would look like. But basically, we appointed small teams to work on these sub-projects. We had a business analyst, a policy person uh, who was empowered to make decisions, a developer, and a scrum master. Um, and the scrum master uh, held everyone accountable. And then we established an overall steering team of supervisors and managers uh, from both IT and the business to keep all this on track. We met weekly. Um, and we empowered uh, these teams to make the decisions and to move things forward. Um, could I have the next slide? And the planning, uh, these again, is, is huge. This is going out into 2015. The previous one was most of 2014. And then the next slide are also uh, North Star-related uh, tasks. So, it's just a massive amount of work, and it would be absolutely impossible using conventional waterfall with existing staffing levels. There's no way we could work through all this and um, at the pace that waterfall requires, or if not at the pace that waterfall requires, to staff it in such a way that we could get turn around things in this kind of timeline. So on, the, on this uh, slide, the SSIS lead is really an IT business analyst, and they are the general organizer of the team. They're responsible for the documentation that needs to be done for the analysis. So, and, you know, again, going back to Kevin and Wade, um, there's still a need for documentation, um, but it tends to happen during the course of the agile uh, scrums as opposed to upfront, and our BAs are handling that. We have a policy lead who's from the business uh, in, engaged or empowered to make decisions. Essentially, that's our product owner. And we have a developer on the team, and the developers really keep pressure on to get decisions made. Um, they help with design but and, and own all the technical responsibility for the sub-projects, but the, you know, the developers are in, in the mindset of, you know, I have a deadline that I have to meet, and they really prod this along. And then the Scrum Master is there to ensure that it is moving, to get rid of barriers. And, and the Scrum Master participates in the steering team to keep that group informed about um, uh, where things are at overall. So if we could go on to the next slide. Some of the cultural impacts are here. Um, so initially, the business struggled to meet any timelines for decisions. But through this process, the business really has a much better appreciation of how long it does take to do development, the complexity that's in there, and why those timelines exist. Um, and by the same token, development has, has a better understanding of business and business considerations. We improved working relationships really at all levels of the staff. Um, initially, not everyone even knew everyone else from business and technical, and now people are on a first-name basis. It's a much different atmosphere on this project than when it started. Um, and, you know, I would say project success is really based on, on good working relationships, mutual respect, and being willing to engage in, in give and take when making hard decisions. And Agile encourages all of that because you're meeting regularly, you're working together, and you have common goals and purposes. Can I have the next slide? So we're not really we're not following a pure agile process. We have uh, uh, 
spectrum. You know, we have sub-project teams. But we are holding policy to the fire in the same that we, way that we do development. And, and this is consistent, I think, with what Kevin said as well, which is the policy has tasks that they have to deliver in here as well as development. Could I have the next slide? And what I'm showing here, and I know it's a little hard to see, but this is a scrum board. It's in a very public area um, of the project, so it's easy to, for anyone to see what the status is of the various sub-projects. But you're looking at policy-related swim lanes or milestones that have to be met in here. So we do use software to help with uh, Agile. We use a product called OnTime, which has a computer-based scrum board and burn-down charts and everything you could want to manage um, an Agile project. But this low fidelity and, and very public um, board is still useful be because everyone can understand this and, and you can quickly get an idea of how we're doing on the various uh, tasks. Can I have the next slide? And this is just more conventional agile. These would be the development tasks. And you might notice that everything is sitting in policy and not in development. This was early into the release cycle. so. Um, Things hadn't moved to development yet. The next slide. So to summarize some of this, the, the outcomes of using Agile for North Star for Children uh, are that we are delivering significant functionality over several releases. And it is an incremental delivery. Uh, we're not delivering everything, everything all at once. Um, we're delivering some base functionality and enhancing it over a number of releases. And, and part of the reason we're able to do that is that we do have the credibility that we are going to have a quarterly release in three months. We have exceptional buy-in from the business community. They've really stepped up to the plate with us and are fully participating in this. Um, the business has a, really an increased appreciation for the complexity of software development and the level of detail that's needed in order to be successful, better understanding of, of all the timelines that are needed, and, and overall it's just fostered excellent working relationships. Could I have the next slide? So what I would say is lessons learned is adapt Agile as needed by the project. Take a look at what Agile is. We, you know, we, we did that from the technical side. Um, some of my people did go to formal Agile training um, and learned quite a bit about it, but in the end we just adapted it to meet our needs. Um, we're transparent with the business community. Um, they understand our planning process. They understand um, a lot more about what IT can and can't do, what's, what's reasonable for us to deliver what and what's not. And, and we have those conversations with the business and let them participate in everything, in the prioritization and the decision making and so on and so forth. So they're definitely partners at the table in planning the projects, which is a, a healthy change. And finally, um, Agile tends to hold everyone accountable, including the business, and um, that's important. Next slide. As far as insights go, the business analysts are really key players in here. They're, for us, they're the organizers, they're the documenters. They do understand business and IT, and so they're a linchpin in this. The developers do push the process along. They put demands on business and analysis for, for decisions, but developers are timeline driven um, and get pretty excited when they think they're going to miss a deadline, which leads to business has to make timely decisions. And then finally, uh, plans for the future. We, are, we will continue to incorporate the business and agile projects as we go forward, and we'll continue to work to improve the process um, internally. Uh, there's, there's plenty of improvement possible, a lot to clean up. But we are evangelizing the benefits throughout the organization because Agile has really made what looked like an impossible project uh, possible. So that's what I have. Tom, thank you so very much. Um, and I, I uh, suggest that we just listen to three absolutely excellent presentations with a tremendous amount of information uh, having been shared. So I want to extend a huge thank you to Tom, Wade, and Kevin. And now let's move to our attendee Q&A session. Um, may we open the phone lines and, uh, and or chat 
uh, to our attendees. Um, and Elizabeth, I'm going to let you manage this portion. Sure. <clears throat> if I could ask our operator to remind the audience how to queue up for questions, please. Thanks for audio participants. If you would like to ask a question, please press star 1. Be sure to record your name clearly when prompted. While we're waiting for people uh, to line up on the phone, we did have some questions come in during the presentations. Um, a couple of different questions about uh, user testing. How did you have to adapt testing strategies to support agile development? Um, how did testers react to not having an entire finished product to test, but rather to be testing pieces or testing in phases? So this is Tom Kind from Minnesota. We tend to handle that by having the testers involved in the in the uh, throughout the process. So even though the formal documentation may be uh, less than what has been there in the past, they've participated in the process and have a good baseline understanding of of what needs to be tested and what the expected results are as a result of that participation. This is Wade from State of Utah. One of the things that we stepped up was our expectation for our uh, testing for our developers. But that wasn't, they kind of had a mindset to, oh, I'll just do some quick testing and throw it over the wall. And those cycles that that generates is, was just way too much to get anything done in a sprint. You could code for a week and then toss it over the wall for three weeks. So we stepped up our expectation of what developers test, and that was part of why we saw the overall um, delivery quality go up. Excellent. Uh, this is Kevin again from Utah, or Kevin from Utah. I, I agree. We had our testers uh, involved in the process, and I agree with Wade that uh, in Agile, sometimes the lines blur a little bit in what position you do because everyone's involved. And when you finish a sprint, you everyone agrees that it is complete, complete. So everyone's involved in the testing of, the, in our case, was program start to finish eligibility. And a uh, second question was about DBAs, and they're moved from ops to the development team. And that was from our that was a question from our first presentation. Uh, and this is Wade. I'm not sure what the question is. It's, uh, it's been somewhat of a challenge. I guess I'll just address what we've done. Um, we underwent a database migration, um, and I didn't talk about that today, but we went from a Sybase database that we managed ourselves operationally to a SQL Server database that was hosted centrally at our Department of Technology Services. And so that was the first slice of the change in roles for our DBAs um, because they were no longer worried about uh, or doing the operational kinds of tasks of keeping the database up and backed up and replicated to our uh, warm site. Um, so yeah, we are actually still struggling a little bit, and we even talked about that today, the, the, the challenge to split up uh, just our operational in terms of our application, you know, the, the fixes and bugs and, 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 the, and, the, um, and the development teams. Um, part of the issue, too, is we've had a historical culture of our DBAs doing all of the stored procedures, both coding and testing. And, uh, and we're fairly stored procedure heavy, and we're actually looking that we will shift some of those responsibilities. Um, really, stored dis procedure development is software development, and so um, th there's no reason that, at least for the simple ones, that our developers can't do some of that as well. So, um, yeah, we have some work to go there. Um, again, that might play into the, the blurring of roles. The DBA may get involved in some testing and may develop some different skills as well. At the same time, we've had some attrition on our team, which has helped uh, kind of balance out what, because we've lost those operational tasks. Um, another question that's come in. If you say you don't have as many things written down, how do you make sure you have quality documentation at the end of the effort? Um, if another state asks for your documentation, do you have anything that you could share? For Minnesota, yes, we we generally do. That's a, a key a key part for us is a is a business analyst who who can document as we go, and it it it's difficult. I I think it's a difficult skill, but it is important that we that we do wind up with documented processes, and and we do at the end of the day. Okay. 
ours, the answer would be uh, they're just different. Um, they're developed in design sessions with the teams and uh, are probably just a little bit harder to read for some individuals because they're brainstorming of how to be able to deliver what it is that's being required to be delivered in the sprint. Um, so there is a lot of documentation. It's just not in the normal um, format of pre-defined uh, business requirements. Uh, and so I think that that's, that's probably the tricky part. And with the verbal communication, we did find that some people it was very difficult to just have verbal communication. So we would draft some things, but we would try to keep that outside of the teams and have the product owner and the business owner uh, draft some of the formal communications of what it was we were doing. Uh, but um, the, the teams would define what tasks need to be completed. And so the formal business requirements were developed in the form of tasks that needed to be assigned to people on the team to be able to complete. So there's a whole history of our system to be able to monitor those tasks. It's just probably a little bit uh, difficult to follow and just share across uh, someone that wasn't involved. In. So it does limit that uh, possibility from sharing and being readable to another state. Do we have any questions on the phone? We do. Our first question comes from Ann Hunt. Your line is open. Um, hi. Um, I'm Ann Hunt from the state of Washington, and we are just um, starting to move into an agile shop. And we are planning using Team Foundation Server as a supporting tool. I was wondering if um, you guys are using supporting tools at all or if anybody is using that one specifically. This is Wade from the state of Utah. Yes, we are using Team Foundation Server. It uh, aligns well if you're heading down the Microsoft road. Um, we have had a few challenges, and I'm probably not the very best expert to talk about that, but um, uh, we're trying to do some some customization to some columns that will allow us to do some reporting and pulling of information so that we can manage things better through TFS. Um, but yeah, it's, it's been a great tool for us. We're doing all of our version control and you know managing our re releases out of that as well. And this uh, is Tom. Cool. You may hear from us later. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Glad to help. Tom from Minnesota here. We we use OnTime. It's the name of a product. Um, we also use TFS. Um, I'm not as familiar with TFS. On time is highly configurable um, and tailorable. Uh, it's a little more expensive, and it doesn't have the source control that TFS offers. Thank you. Yep. Do we have other questions on the phone? Currently, there are no other audio questions. Again, if you'd like to ask a question, please press star 1. Okay. We have quite a few that came in over chat. Um, why did you choose to develop in-house rather than using COT software? Uh, at, at the time the Minnesota SAC was started, um, the, the project at this point is more than 20 years old. There simply was no COT software available. So the f first release of what became the SAC was system was um, in late 99. Uh, at this stage, at, within the Minnesota Department of Human Services, COT software is being evaluated as a potential replacement for many legacy systems, including SACWIS. This is Wade. I mean, I think historically, um, SACWIS is one of those things that's so highly customized, we, we just have stayed away from that. But part of that has also just been a, a funding issue and cost issue for a small state like ours. But our modernization effort uh, this time around is actually continuing to use the existing database structure that we have. So we'll have new modules that will refer to tables um, in our old, in our regular database. And so it's kind of a phased rollout that way. We'll, we'll disable modules in the Power Builder side as we create modules in the new side. Now there's some re-engineering that's going to take place, but that's part of the reason. And again, just uh, resources. When you're using a combination of both waterfall and agile approaches, how do you address budgeting for these two different approaches? I would echo what Wade said about the difficulty of contracting. So we we do some staff augmentation contracting, not a lot of it, and I've had trouble getting contracts through the describe an agile process, and I've had contract review and legal staff. Um, uh, in 
in order to satisfy them, have to go back in and, and really do a more waterfall-like approach to to the contracts. Um, you know, and as far as budgeting, um, it, you know, as Wade said, we know in general what the overall target is. So I don't know if that's a lot different, Wade. Yeah. Um We've had these time and materials contracts in place for for a number of years. We've never had the fixed price, and so it kind of was just a natural evolution for us to continue to use those. And as far as budgeting, it's it's been a, a matter of um, we don't even really have building blocks, so we haven't done it that way. We've had some grant money and some carryover money made available to us, and so we've just worked to the amount that we have there, if that helps. How would you all suggest um, selling, for want of a better word, Agile to executive staff? Well, what I did was um, <clears throat> address a specific problem with it and was able to prove that it worked in, in the small. So by developing a, a reliable release schedule, we had a lot of benefits. And by the time we needed it, for the business, we had a track record that showed that we could deliver using Agile. So if I were trying to sell it, I would look at specific issues that you have and, and pick out what looks like some low-hanging fruit to try to address with an Agile process and see if you can prove out that you can do it. Yeah, this is Wade. I think that's, that, that I'd echo that same approach. And uh, we, we certainly pointed out the the ability that we thought we'd have to be able to deliver more frequently, and we've been able to do that. So we've had their support. This, Elizabeth, this is Joyce, and I and I would just like to add, uh, make a comment here. I think um, in order to market to uh, executive management, if you appeal um, to uh, the horse historical track record of plan-driven or waterfall-driven projects, um, you you certainly have some statistics that you can you can use. Okay, thanks, Ruth. I want to go back to the phones and just see if we have any questions on the phone. There are currently no audio questions. Again, if you'd like to ask a question, please press star one. Okay, I have two more online. Uh, first up, what type of automated regression testing software did you use? Um, we are using Test Complete, and that it, for Minnesota that was a good choice because we're still a Windows-based application instead of web-based, and that particular product works well with a conventional Windows-based application. And this is Wade. We've used Rational Robot for our Power Builder site for a number of years, and we are transitioning it. It did not work as well with .NET, so we've got a new product called Ranorex, and we are just getting that rolling. Okay. And then last question I have. It's a, it's a nice, easy one. What do requirements look like under Agile? <laughs> I was kidding about it being a easy question. <laughs> well, you know, requirements are kind of what we're listing at the front of the process. So when I put policy up there on the board uh, with everyone else, the task the policy takes off of this are to deliver the requirements and be able to stand by them in, in the sprint or in the iteration as a part of it. You know, this is Wade, and I, I think I'd add that, that Agile isn't something that there's just a book for that you just plug in. I think a requirement looks like what you need it to look like for your project. And what it needs to look like for the people that are involved and how, mm -hmm. how well they embrace Agile or not. Perfect. I'm showing that we're right at 3.30, so Joyce, I'm going to turn it back around to you to wrap things up for us. Okay, thank you, and uh, excellent questions and excellent answers. So um, we hope that the information shared with you today was both informative and valuable. And we also understand that Agile development processes may be new to some of you who have attended. Um, thus, we have attached a reference guide, which you may find useful. And Elizabeth, if you'd click ahead a couple of slides, please. <coughs> One, so we've uh, 
included some uh, definitions. Next slide. We've uh, included some context comparing, comparing um, waterfall versus agile, and we've also included uh, some disciplines and the differences between plan-driven versus agile. So um, go back to our uh, conclusion slide, please. So <clears throat> um, again, uh, as a, and as a reminder, please remember to register for the January webinar once that announcement is released. Um, additionally, if you have any questions regarding today's topic, and I'm sure there might be some, so please, um, it, or if you would like more information about any of our scheduled webinars, or would like to volunteer your state as a topic presenter, please do not hesitate to contact me again at the email list at joyce at kfx.com. Again, this webinar has been recorded and will be made available online. When it is complete and posted, we will send a message via the SACWIS listserv. And lastly, again, I want to thank our three presenters. You did a fantastic job. Uh, and I'm very pleased that we've had um, a, a large number of attendees because I think this topic is obviously of great interest. So happy holidays to everyone, and thank you for attending. Goodbye.